welcome to week four. Class, welcome to week four. We are at the halfway point going into um, another great week. I tell you, you guys are doing a great job. Uh, very good discussion on your discussion items as well as on your journals. And I hope you're starting to look at the, uh, the end project as well. So, so what do we got going on in week four? Let's take a look at this. Um, talking about Microsoft Windows, Unix and um, in Unix like or Linux type systems and endpoints So the different activities that we got reading to do in chapters 10 to 12 that deals with uh, like I say the topics we just talked about Microsoft Windows, uh, we, Unix and and your endpoints thread discussion. Also, there's some yeah, like I say, biblical integration videos. Like I said, thank you guys for who have made comments on those uh, devotional videos that I put into the class. Really appreciate your comments, your feedback, it's great stuff and your journal article reviews do. And let's take a look at our lecture for, the, for this week. Now, what I'm going to talk about this week is somewhat of a review of operating systems, okay? So it may be, uh, like I say, hopefully this is a review for most of you guys. I'm not really going to get into endpoints. We're really just going to kind of walk through Microsoft Windows and talk a little bit about uh, Linux and Linux or Unix-like Linux operating systems. So to start this off, let's look at some basic computer design. Now, again, 101, this is... This is stuff that I'm sure you guys had several terms ago, so it should be just a refresher for you. So when we think about a computer system, it's, it, it's built by design in layers. This is built this way, so for many reasons. The main one is for security. So here at the, at the bottom, at the, this layer, we always start with some type of hardware, and that's your CPU, that's your storage, that's memory, all of those things. Then we install an operating system on top of that. That could be Windows, it could be Mac OS, it could be many of the different uh, Linux distributions, but that operating system is installed on top of hardware, and then on top of that hardware, that's just where our applications, uh, whether it's Excel, PowerPoint, uh, all the video games, whatever those things are, they stack on top of that, and then we, the human, we interface with that. Like I say, so you see it's a very um, uh, serial path, and, and here again, done that way for a reason. Uh, that's we we layer security in uh, at these different layers so that as a user, you have very limited access to different things as a, just a basic user. If you are a power user or a privileged user, yeah, you have commands where you can get to the other deeper layers. But really, um, from a security, we want to be sure that users have ability to interface with applications. Applications interface with the operating system. Operating system interfaces with the hardware. So again, when we talk about this basic operating design or basic operating system, um, you know, again, it starts with this thing we call hardware. Now, when you think about hardware, think about it from a component perspective, where you got hard drives, or today we're using a lot of SSDs, but really this is your permanent storage. This is uh, part of your non-volatile memory where we store things long-term. Uh, we have uh, RAM, that's volatile memory. And then as we get closer to the CPU, we have different layers of cache, uh, layer one, layer two, up to layer three, and now layer four cache. And some of this is actually on the motherboard itself, and some of the cache is actually with, it's, we have memory or registers within the CPU itself. So this is your underlying architecture for uh, your hardware. We look at the operating systems, actually we at the core of any operating system, we have what we call a kernel. Okay, and this kernel is really what your operating system is all about. Go back to the days of, and I'm sure some of you guys may remember, some of you older guys, uh, some of you younger ones probably not, but uh, MS-DOS, right? Microsoft Disk Operating System. That was that kernel that ran underneath the, all the Windows uh, 3.1 and uh, Windows NT all the way up to, I think, Windows 7, they, where they still had DOS running underneath that. But the kernel is really the heart and the core of any operating system. Then on top of that, we have application uh, program interfaces or APIs and device drivers. And these are things that are that will um, allow us to be able to talk uh, to, to the kernel when we need to uh, talk to the kernel. And that's typically done through some type of shell. Uh, you, uh, you, if you're familiar with Windows now, that we use PowerShell. And that is a way that now as a user, as a, a power user, I can actually talk and interface with the kernel. If you're uh, in the Linux world, we have different types of shell. We got Bash, we got the Born shell, uh, Bash, which is Born Again shell, but different types of shells. And now on top of that layer, this is where we have our operating system applications. Now we don't want to confuse operating system applications with user applications. User applications are all these things in this top layer um, that are part of that we as a user. Operating system applications, you know, these are things. Um, uh, like I say, like your your shell, your file manager, control panel, all of these things are applications, right? And they uh, are, operate as part of the application. How do you understand the difference in an application? Um, excuse me. 
a user application and an operating system application. If you install Windows right out of the box, right? Right out of the box, all those things you see, like, again, like file manager, uh, control panel, all of those things that came with Windows is operating system applications. Now, later you go out and you buy uh, the Office Suite or Office 365, those are your user applications. Now, to make this process work, we have to have to have some type of I.O. devices, input output devices, whether they're keyboard, mouse, or uh, monitors, or, or printers, whatever they are, this is how we, as a human, we're able to get things in and out of the system. Okay, so how do all these pieces come together? Well, we got the hardware layer, we've got our I.O. devices, and we have an operating system with user applications. Well, it starts, you know, in this kernel. So let's say that, you know, as a user, you know, I want to access a file on my hard drive. I've got a Word document that I want to make some updates to, okay? So that I, now, through an I.O. device, it's gonna tell that kernel, all right, go to the hard drive, whether it's an SSD or whatever type of permanent drive you've got there, and I want you to pull this particular file. Now, with the, because how this really helps work, because the kernel is what helps sets up the file structure or the boot structure or the file structure on that drive, which is why once you've uh, formatted a drive, let's say uh, to use Windows, uh, it, that drive typically will not work well in a Linux environment and vice versa. Now, there are some file formats that will operate uh, between the two. Um, but overall, like I say, when something formatted for Windows, it's typically not going to operate in, in a Linux world and vice versa. So let's say, let's say we're in a, a, a Windows world. So we've got this kernel. It knows where to look on this hard drive for this Word document. It knows all the sectors. Where, where these ones and zeros are stored because it's set up that, that file structure um, with the file system. That's the whole purpose of the file system. And whether we're using you know, NTFS or whatever the file system may be, that is what it does. It, it sets up a structure. So now the kernel knows how to go out and retrieve things off of that drive. It brings it back in. And from there, it says, okay, let's put some of these some of this into memory. So it sends that into RAM. And from RAM, it does processing, but it also sends things to cache and to different memories, and it also loads instructions into these registers. So not only am I pulling up the document, but it also pulls up you know, the Microsoft Word instructions so that the, the CPU now knows how to process this data based on the instruction set that has been loaded in there. So now I am able to, on my monitor, I can see my Word document that I pulled up. I can make changes to it. I can save it. And when I do that save, like I say, now it, it can write, it send that back to the kernel. The kernel saves those changes back on the hard drive. So you see, that's the process, that whole uh, fetch, store, decode, execute that goes on within the CPU. But it's all based on that kernel knowing where to go to volatile, non volatile memory, pull it, bring it in, drop it into RAM because RAM is faster, move it over to cache into one layer one, layer two, cache, which is even faster so that the CPU can process it more efficiently and provide an output to some type of device, some type of IO device. Basic operations. Now, from a security perspective, like I say there's a lot of things going on here as well. Like I say, when we think about this kernel, that kernel also controls what we call the TCB, your trusted computing base, okay? Or you may hear it called the reference monitor in some applications, in some areas, some, some uh, instantiations, you hear it called a reference monitor. And that reference monitor or TCB is where all your policies, your access control policies, your process identifiers or PIDs, this is where all these things are established. And also this is where we start capturing events and within our event viewer, so if we have to set up audit logs, that process starts taking place automatically within that operating system. Now, I like to use an analogy for this because really the, the way an operating system works is really no different than what we do day to day. All right, this, this is a computer analogy of what I call Ada's Kitchen. Ada's Kitchen. So we have Ada here, she loves to cook. Mm, yes, loves to cook. So she's here, she's gonna make a salad. That's right, she's gonna make a nice, fresh garden salad with all these delicious, you know, mouth-watering uh, fruits and vegetables. Okay, so Ada, she is actually the CPU. This is where work is getting done. She is also the one that's gonna go fetch and decode and cut and slice and dice these things. So we look at that. Now, this cutting board, this is like her cache memory. I mean, this is where work is getting done, but she can only put a few things on this cutting board at a time. So right now she's slicing and dicing some cucumbers, right? But only a few, but but the great thing about it, she can slice and dice these things really fast. So when you think about that cache, again, small amount of memory, but it's really, really, really fast. Now the countertop, right? Let's look at her kitchen countertop. That's kind of like RAM. 
So you see over here, this is where we have, we have she has a bowl with cucumbers already sliced and some more here that she wants to slice sitting on the countertop. So you see the countertop is actually a, lot, a little bigger than um, the cutting board. So that's where she wants to keep things that she's gonna use a lot, keep them close to her as the CPU. Now, refrigerator, what is that? Yeah, think of your refrigerator as your storage, long-term storage. This is where she keeps all the fruit and vegetables that she's gonna make for the salad. Now, as anybody knows who likes to cook, you walk into a kitchen, what is the one thing you're gonna want, right? Is more countertop. The more countertop you've got, the more stuff you can put on that countertop. Well, see, your computer is no different. The same thing. Um, the more RAM, the more random access memory you have, the more things that you can do at one time and set out, which means that's a little, you don't have to go back to the refrigerator. So let's say back here before she had a big countertop. Think what she would have to do. Okay, she'd have to go take something out of the refrigerator, bring it, set it on that little countertop, prepare it, put it back into the refrigerator. So she's having to make multiple trips back and forth to that refrigerator, pulling things out and put them on that little countertop Chop, 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 put it in a bowl, put it back in the refrigerator. Not very efficient, is it? If you've cooked, you know, oh no, I can't do this. I, I've got to, I need more space. Well, that's the same thing your computer does when you don't have enough RAM. It starts doing page files on the hard drive. So now your CPU is having to go get something out of um, volatile memory, non-volatile memory, I'm sorry, out of, your, out of your hard drive, bring it, process it, put it back. Bring it, process it, put it back and you are burning through a lot of CPU cycles and not getting a lot of things done because your computer is not operating as efficiently as it should. So that's why, yes, we're gonna get more countertop or we're gonna add additional RAM to our computers, why? So everything that she needs, she can go to the refrigerator one time, she gets the lettuce, the onions, the tomatoes, cheese, all of these things, put them on that big countertop, and now she is very efficient, chopping, chop, 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 in a bowl, grab this, chop, 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 in a bowl, grab the cheese, slice, slice, dice, dice, and slice. Ooh, man, I'm ready for a salad right now, just talking about this. So that is how this whole piece goes together. And then when she finishes that salad, what does she do with it? Boom, yeah, she can put it back in that refrigerator and good to go. So your, 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 your operating system, hardware, it all works very similar to things that we do day to day. Now, a component, and we're gonna kind of switch gears here. Let's talk about Windows specifically with respect to what we're talking about this week. One of the biggest components that we need to be aware of is what we call the registry, okay, in Windows. And that's how Windows operates. That's how Windows functions differently than other operating systems like a Mac OS or uh, a Unix-like or a Linux uh, version of an OS because this registry structure is, is a little bit different. Different. What is a registry? So this registry is a huge database that stores everything about your PC, including hardware information, network information, user preferences, uh, file type, application information. Um, and the thing, you know, in life, there's always trade-off, guys. There's always trade-offs. You know, Windows is, is, is what, well, yeah, it's probably one of the biggest, well, the biggest operating system that's used uh, commercially as well as with individuals probably in the world, you know. Why? Because it is able to work with a lot of different hardware, uh, able to work with a lot of different software, and these things integrate. Well, that's very convenient, and very. but the trade-off is we have to use this thing called the registry to be able to ensure that our operating system can talk to all these various components. So that's what that registry does. Now, when you think about configuration or configuring a Windows machine, all those configurations take place in that registry. Now, where this registry stored at is in your Sys32, your System32 config folder for each user account that you have. So, and these registries, what time you hear them called hives, you know, um, why they come with the word hive, don't really know, but yeah, you'll hear them called hives. Um, and it has a, a structure. Now, how do we edit these? Something we call the registry editor, regedit. Uh, have, and, that, and that's how we can access and edit uh, these different things. So when we think about these, like I said, there's basically five um, root keys or sub subgroups. Now, again, this is, think of this as a hierarchical database. That's really all it is within the Windows operating environment. It's a hierarchical database that's structured and it has a tree structure. So when we think about the different classes, like I said, if you look at the registry edit, editor, you've got uh, that H key, that's a hive, it's talking about, it's a hive key. That hive key for classes or the, your root editor, the hive key for your current user, you have hive keys for all the users, you have hive keys for the local machine, and you have a current configuration uh, hive key. 
So these are the, are the basic roots. Now you can drill into these a little bit farther and these roots, are, they have sub keys underneath that. If you ever start digging into your registry, you're gonna see it is a massive, massive folder stru uh, structure with subfolders and subfolders under those. And then you get to these, these keywords and, and D words and Q words. It's, it's a pretty you know, intricate structure if you're not familiar with it. So like I say, so we kind of look at our picture. You see, so we have, here's our, here's our, um, our roots and we've clicked on one of those. So like I say, then underneath um, local machine, you see now we have hardware and, and the, uh, so the SAM, the security module, uh, the security, the software, and then underneath that, if we click on system and it breaks out even farther where you got sub keys and keys under that, and then sub keys underneath sub keys underneath your active sub key. So it just keeps indenturing down. Then when you actually click on those, this is when you actually get into uh, the what you're actually editing, actually the different uh, entry names. So you can make changes. And please, if you're going to play around with your Windows machine, be very careful because you can screw something up really quickly if you don't know what you're doing and you try to start and you just arbitrarily start changing values. But here's your entry name, the data type, and what those values should be. So... <clears throat> So when you look at our values, there's different types of values. You have string values. Like I said, basically what that is, they, they're a very flexible type of value, very common uh, with a string value. Uh, these SDs really talks about string values. Uh, you have binary values, and that's usually something like it's not a long string, it's usually like a one or a zero. You have D word values. This is your 32-bit word uh, binary values, and Q word values are 64-bit uh, binary values. So when you start clicking on these and you, it's going to open up and you see where you can actually change some of these values. I'm going to take a short break, get a little drink of water. Yes. Oh, yes. Good stuff. Yes, I have my lovely assistant sitting right here. And she heard that I was getting a little, a little raspy. So that's what, when we think about now, when you think about a system administration uh, as a sysad, you know, and, and making changes uh, in this environment, this is where you like you, oh, you hear them talk GPO, you know, group policy uh, orchestration. Many, this is where these settings are done. Uh, so when something is changed by group policy, many times this is what we're doing. We're going in, we're, we're changing values within the, our hive structure, within our registry structure. So uh, just critical to understand that from a system administration perspective. And I know within the lesson it's talking about um, active directory and all those things, but I think it's important to understand what's also happening under the hood in a Windows environment. All right, let's talk about a Linux environment. So let's say Windows, you know, we, we just got through going over it, talking about, you know, that hive structure. Now at the core of Linux, and if you're not familiar with Linux, Linux, like this, it's a generic term referring to a Unix-like operating system. That's really all it is. It started with Unix. Now what's the difference? Uh, you know, if something is Unix, then that is proprietary. So typically you're gonna have to pay for it with, with a Unix design, whether it's Solaris um, or uh, there's multiple. Your, your Mac, if you own a Mac, that is a Unix, um, environment. So, which is why you don't get it free. That's why, but because it's based, it is a proprietary Unix. Linux, on the other hand, like I say, these are for the most part, not all, for the most part, they, you, you know, they are open source and you can obtain the distribution for free. It's a multi-user, multitasking, multi-processor system, and it can run on multiple platforms as well. It's a very, um, agile operating system. And I'll tell you in a minute why people love it. So there's a lot of distributions. And what is, what is a distribution? Okay, a distribution is where you have a kernel and you have uh, the, those, going back to that same model we talked about earlier, and you have the operating system applications and you have the download instructions. That is what makes up a distribution. Uh, like I say, whether it's Red Hat, uh, Debian, you know, Gentoo, Kali, a lot of different distributions. I mean, there are thousands of distributions. And the great thing about Linux, you can get a core, I mean, a, um, a kernel, and you can build your own and launch your own distribution. And and no one cares, you know, hey, go for it. Uh, as long as you have the documentation to support that. So Linux is based on a files. Everything's a file. Everything's a file. And these files are kept in directories. And then you have directories within directories. Um, you have a file system, a file system called FSH, F -F FHS, I'm sorry. Uh, that's your hardcore standard that defines the rules for these Linux files. At the root, at the very top of, of a Linux file structure is always gonna be root. And you can always see that we you know with the with a with a slash, you know. Oh, <laughs> excuse me. Files directories can be owned by users, and that is how we're able to enforce security 
within a Linux environment is based on file ownership. So let's take a look at this high, this uh, hierarchical file structure within Linux. Like I say, it always starts at the top, you know, boom, you know, with, with that slash. Now within that, like I said, that's your, your primary hierarchy, that's your root directory. Now, from a security perspective, this is what we really want to protect is people who have root access. You hear it's called have root access to a system. You get, if, if, the, if someone have gotten privileged escalation to root access, they can own you. They've got you. They can change anything in there that they want. So that's why giving permissions like SU, super user, or sudo, as super user do, uh, are very, very, very critical that we manage and monitor who have those accesses. So when we look at this file structure, like I say, you've got your bin or binary, that's where your binary files are. Uh, the boot, that's where your bootloader files, the dev, DEV. And you're gonna, I'm sure if you worked on a Linux environment, any at all, you've seen some of these these acronyms, uh, shortcuts, and you may wonder what is they, you know, what, what does that mean? But yeah, they all have a meaning. The Etsy, that's what we call it, ETC Etsy. That's where a lot of your configuration, all your system configuration files are. Your home directories, libraries uh, are stored, you know, your system libraries and kernel modules. Uh, your media, your mount points for external uh, hard drives. Like I say, when you think about, you know, in, in the Windows environment, if you plug in a device, right, and I say a thumb drive, it'll pop up as the next letter, you know, the C drive or the E drive, D drive, F drive, Z drive. If you notice in a, in a Linux environment, it doesn't work that way. Why? Because it will mount that and it will see that uh, device as a file system. Okay. So you don't have that A, uh, B drive, C drive, D drive within that Linux environment. So this is really what that, that you know, that, that file structure starts to look like. So some of the ones you, you'll see we use a lot is the var, where your variables are is contained, uh, the home, the lib, especially Etsy, dev, Etsy, the, the, those directories use quite a bit. And then like I say now that file structure within each of these, they have sub file structures behind those. And based on whether it's a user, what is inside of those, and then within those, this is where you can keep breaking out farther and farther. Like I say, some of the ones that we use quite a bit, some of the common ones, like root, you know, the Etsy, like that's where your system configs are, the dev, uh, that's where you, that's really for device. That's where your device file nodes are stored. Uh, the bins or the S secure, the S bins, this is where your binary or your executable files are stored, are stored. as well as uh, your, your libs. You have executable stored in, that, in those libraries. Uh, home, that's where all your user information. The var, these are where your variables contain user files that continually change a lot. In a Linux environment, understanding how to navigate, okay? And, and, and navigation is really based on very similar to scripting. Uh, and if you understand starting how, how to script, and, and then the, the same syntax, the same uh, format works very similar. So we have what we call a CLI, a command line interface taxonomy. Uh, with any command, you know, you have a basic structure. You have the command, you have options, and you have arguments, okay? Actually, the command, that, that is your basic part of the command. The option, that changes the behavior of the command. The argument is used to provide additional information for a command. Let me give you an example. So ls, which is list, okay? If I want to see what's the, all, what the files within a directory, uh, ls gives me the list. That's the command. lsa. That is the option. And this part right here is the argument. So, so what have I done? Basically, I've taken the command and I, and I a list. If I use the option, which is A, that's gonna display all the files, including hidden files. If I just type ls, enter, I'm gonna see files, but I'm not gonna see the hidden ones. If I did a ls dash L, that's gonna give everything in a long display, not in a tabular display like you would normally see. So you see there, I can sort, I can do different sorts. Now, the argument here is telling me where I want to look. If I just do ls uh, dash a, it is just gonna list what is in the, the root directory of where I am. But by using this argument, I say I want to list in a display with everything that's in the etsy auditd.config subfolder. So that is how that works. Com your command, your option, and your argument. Let's give you examples of this. All right, here's where I just ran a command, ls, and it just, here again, it did. It just listed the files that it saw in my home directory. Now, this is what happens when I use that dash A option. Not only do I get these files, it also shows me, again, the hidden files, like the, the, the dot dots, the subdirectories, the, the back home trash, you know, the config, cups, a lot of things that you don't see when you just run ls. Another example, if I do ls with the L option, 
it gives me in a long list format, but look what it also starts to give me. It gives me, tells me if this is a directory, if the uh, options are turned on to read, do I have or permissions to read, to write, uh, to execute that file. And also tells me how many sub files are, uh, are in that folder. So if it's D, that tells me that's a directory and I have all these files within that. So it starts giving me a lot more information. It starts giving me the size, the time, the date, whether it's an app, you know, and as well as, you know, the, the name of what that is. So depending on how you want to run it. So I did the same thing and I changed my argument to slash desktop. So instead of just seeing what's in my home folder, this shows me what was on the desktop. So when we think about some of the common commands that we use in this Linux environment, you know, change directory. If I do CD dot dot, that moves me up one layer, one level in the directory. I can list files, MV, move files, RM. I want to delete or remove files. C L I E A R. It's clear. Whew, I can't spell it. That. Uh, that's how you can clear the screen. If you've been working in a Linux environment and you, you've been, have a, been hitting all these commands or running commands, pretty soon you're at the bottom of the screen and you've got so much stuff at the top, you don't know what you're doing. Clear, that clears the screen and you start back at the top. Uh, SU, SU, like I said, that, that's how you become um, you know, a root user. If you do SUDO, sudo, that gives you root privileges for a set amount of time. So you're not a super user, you're in a SUDO, you're in a super user group that says that you're authorized to run certain commands for a certain period of time when you do SUDO, sudo. Uh, so yeah, so th these are some of the things, some of the just basic commands that we use in this uh, uh, Linux environment. Um, now, one of the things from a security perspective that we always talk about is auditing. Now, within the Linux environment, we have a daemon that we run called Audit D. Now, that what that is is part of a distribution. It is a, a, a package that that can be installed. The great thing about Linux, when you download a a distribution like Red Hat or Fedora or um, you know, any of these um, Ubuntu packages, it has a lot of, um, I mean, in these distribution, they have a lot of packages in there already pre-installed, but they haven't been launched. You haven't been executed. So now you have to run some type of command, depending on what type of distribution um, that you need to run. It may be like a YUM, a -U -A -Y -U -M or whatever, that will actually now you can open up this package. So like for instance, Audit D, it's loaded with that distribution, but it's not native until you actually uh, execute that. So, and this is a daemon that's actually run audit D. Whenever you set D behind a command, that's what it means. You know, it's a daemon. It means just, it is just a file that's executable that can be ran. And this one will help you know how to audit. So it will actually start collecting your audit logs and developing and building your, the day, the time and all the information. So you can actually audit your operating system. So actually that's just an example of how that, you know, and then from there, this is the way you can configure it, but it's important to know where these things live so that you know where to find them. For instance, if you want to do um, any type of configuration, you got need to go to the uh, config file, which is in the Etsy audit, audit D dot C-O-N-F, which is config. So knowing where things exist and understanding where you are in the Linux file structure is probably one of the most, um, I won't say complicated, but one of the things you have to work sometimes to understand, and if you don't know where you are, you can get lost really quickly. So understanding that piece. But really, I'm not going to go in deep into auditing. Just kind of want to show you um, what that looked like. Uh, so, so we've talked a little bit about Windows. We've talked a little bit about uh, Linux from an operating system perspective. Hope this helps you out as you start <coughs> going deeper into the class this week. Did not get into endpoints that much. I just wanted to spend the time more so on the operating system. Hey, have a great week four. If you got questions, Reach out. We always love to hear from you. Have a blessed week.